So in the second um, video dealing with um, chapter 3, we're going to look at some uh, more complex um, problems in unit conversions and dimensional analysis. So we're going to outline this procedure that we call dimensional analysis, which is a method of using the unit to make certain that um, our calculations are on track. We're going to also talk about how density can be um, used to convert between mass and volume. And then we're going to look at um, conversion factors that are similar to density, um, but uh, that they're referred to as equivalency conversion factors. Um, and we're going to see how we can use that to convert between different quantities. And then we'll do um, a brief review of the topic of percentage and uh, percentage error. Percentage error might be new to you. And then finally, we'll look at how we use formulas to convert between different temperature scales. So dimensional analysis is a um, system that we've kind of already began um, using where we use the unit labels as a um, technique of seeing um, whether our calculation is heading in the right direction. So in de um, dimensional analysis, what we're using um, are the unit labels to help confirm that we've got our calculation set up correctly. It's generally done in three steps, although you don't have to do these three steps formally and write step one, step two, step three beside them. But the essence of what we're going to do is we're going to leave the units in while we're carrying out our mathematical operations. And we're going to treat them algebraically and we're going to multiply, divide and cancel our units. So in this procedure, what we do is we write the given quantity and its units on the far left of the page. You leave a nice big space and then on the far right of the page, you write the wanted units. And then we kind of set up the conversion factors, which will be fractions, to take us from the given quantity with its units into the wanted units. So we've got our given quantity. What we're going to do then is going to multiply it by one or perhaps more conversion factors. These guys are being fractions until we eventually arrive at the unit that we want. So what we'll then do is we'll cancel our units to make sure that everything is set up correctly. And then finally, we'll enter the numbers into our calculator and make sure that we got the correct number. So here's a good example. This is just going to be a single step conversion. It says a tablet of aspirin contains 0.25 grams of aspirin. How many milligrams of aspirin does the tablet contain? So on the left, I write what I'm given. And on the right, I write the unit for what I want. I then multiply this by one or more conversion factors until I arrive at the unit that I want. So my conversion factor always has to have the given unit on the bottom line. It's always a fraction. And in this case, it's quite simple. One milligram over 10 to the minus 3 grams will be my conversion factor. Grams will cancel out, giving me what I want. And so cancel out my units and then enter the um, numbers into my calculator and get my answer. And in this case, I chose to express it in um, scientific notation. So this is an example that's slightly different. In this case, I have one metric unit and this metric unit has a prefix. It has, it's in centimeters. And then I'm going to convert that into another metric unit and again, our metric unit on in this occasion has a prefix. So step one, write what I'm given on the left of the page, and then step two, write what I the units for what I want on the right of the page. So in this case, I have a problem where both of the units have metric prefixes. When you see this situation, what you want to do is you want to first convert to what we call the base unit. That is the units without the prefix, which in this case will be meters. So my first conversion factor is going to take centimeters and turn it into meters. And it turns out that there are 10 to the minus 2 meters in 1 centimeter. Centi means multiply by 10 to the minus 2. So at this point, I'm at meters. And so I need a conversion factor with meters on the bottom. And uh, where I'm heading is millimeters, so I can do this in one, just one more step. One millimeter over 
10 to the minus 3 meters. So that's going to get my meters and I'm going to be left with what I want. So all of my conversion factors are constructed just by taking the letter and replacing it with the power of 10. You'll notice in my conversion factor that the 1 always goes next to the unit that has the, um, the decimal prefix and then the power of 10 always goes against the base unit. So you should always be like 1 centimeter, 1 decimeter, 1 milliliter and then your power of 10 will always go against the base unit. That's a good way of making certain that you're on track. So once I've got all my units cancelled out and I've convinced myself that I've done uh, the, the setup correctly, I would go ahead and put that into my calculator. I wouldn't even bother putting anything into my calculator until I have crossed out my units on the page and made certain that everything cancels out, leaving me with what I want. Okay, so that's an important thing. This is an error checking method. So if this doesn't work, if you don't cancel out the units, you've basically wasted your time. When it comes to converting volumes, it's a little more complicated. All volumes have units of um, length cubed. And um, so when we perform the conversion, it's more complicated because we will actually have to cube our conversion factor. So in this case, I'm going to try and convert 2.5 by 10 to the minus 6 kilometers cubed into centimeters cubed. So I take note that both of my units have a decimal prefix, so I know that I'm going to go through the base unit. So here I am, step one, I've written the number that I'm given on the left, and then I write the units that I want on the right. So thinking about this, knowing that both of my um, units here have a prefix, I know that I'm going to go from kilometers cubed through the base unit and then on to centimeters cubed. So here I go, 2.5 by 10 to the minus 6 kilometers cubed, and then I've got to multiply by the conversion factor that has kilometers on the bottom and meters on the top. So one kilometer, when I look up the meaning of kilo, it's 10 to the 3, one kilometer for every 10 to the 3 meters. And this is the big thing here, I've got to remember to cube my conversion factor. So that's going to get me to meters cubed. So now I need to go one step further and go from my meters cubed onto my centimeters cubed. So I've got to multiply by the conversion factor that has meters on the bottom line, centimeters on the top line, and I can't forget I need to cube my conversion factor. And so these guys will cancel out. In one centimeter there are 10 to the minus 2 meters. Okay, so that's going to leave me with my centimeters cubed. In each case you'll see that in my conversion factor the 1 always goes next to the unit that has a prefix and then the power of 10 always goes next to the base unit. Same over here, the 1 goes next to the unit that has a prefix, the power of 10 goes next to the base unit. Okay, so as all of my units cancel out, I can be really confident that um, I've got everything set up correctly, and now I can go ahead and enter the numbers into my calculator. So um, I, I'll kind of give you a little um, heads up about a shortcut way of entering in um, these powers of 10 into your calculator. So I'm just going to pop up the, um, the calculator now. If I want to enter in um, 10 to the 3, there's two ways of doing it. So if I want to win 10 to the power of 3 would be one way. And there it is, a 1,000. Or I can also use my scientific notation button and enter this as 1 times 10 to the 3. So that's a, you know, a little, that's a nice little trick there. And there I go, that's still going to be equal to a thousand. So 10 to the power of minus 2. Or alternatively, I can write that as 1 times 10 to the minus 2. 
and it's the same values you can see that there so I like to use the E key rather than entering in as a power of 10 like that that's just what I prefer okay so here's another problem involving um, volume but this time we're going to be working in English units and um, we're going to have to look up some conversion factors in tables because we aren't able to use those six decimal prefixes that we've memorized so here we go in the morning I like to drink a 12 um, 20 <laughs> fluid ounce coffee. I actually like to drink a 12 fluid ounce coffee, but um, I made this a huge number. Uh, 20 fluid ounce coffee. What is this volume expressed in gallons? So this is what I'm starting with. I write that on the left, 20, 20 fluid ounces. And on the right, I write the units for what I want, which are gallons. So now I have to try and find some conversion factors. And what I found is that in my book, there's nothing relating fluid ounces and gallons directly. But there are two equivalencies, one that relates fluid ounces to quarts and then also another one that relates quarts to gallons. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go from fluid ounces onto quarts and then from quarts into gallons. So for these English to English conversions, the exact pathway you take really depends on the conversion, um, the conversion factors that are ab available to you. So 20 fluid ounces times one quart per 32 fluid ounces. So you see I have the units that I want to get rid of on the bottom. So whatever you start with over here always ends up on the bottom of your conversion factor. And then now I've got quarts, so my next conversion factor has quarts on the bottom. And then there's one gallon for every four quarts. So I'm very confident that I've got this because all my units cancel out. So as all my units cancel out, I can go ahead and put that into my calculator. Now, this makes sense. I got 0.156 gallons. Uh, you know, 20 fluid ounces is no is only going to be a fraction of a gallon. So I'm very pleased that I got a number that is smaller than one. Here's an example where uh, we're going to convert between a um, metric unit. And we're going to turn that into an English unit. So in this case, I'm going to take 43 kilograms and I'm going to turn it into pounds. They gave me a little bit of information here saying that one pound is equal to 453.6 grams. So I write what I'm given on the left of my page. I leave a big space and I write the units that I want on the right. As I'm given the relationship between pounds and grams, but not the relationship between kilograms and pounds. A sensible um, pathway might be to go from kilograms to grams using decimal prefixes and then from grams onto pounds using the information that was given in the problem. So this is how I would do it. First of all, I'm going to go from kilograms to grams and I'm going to use my, um, my prefix here to help me construct the, um, the conversion factor. So 43 kilograms times 10 to the 3 grams for every 1 kilogram. And you can see I always have the units that I begin with on the bottom line. My 1 is going next to the unit that has the prefix. And then the meaning of that prefix expressed as a power of 10 goes next to the base unit. So now I'm ready to go onwards from grams onto pounds. So I need grams on the bottom line here and pounds on the top line. And I'm going to use the information from my equivalency, I get one pound per 453.6 grams. So grams will cancel out and I'm left with the pounds. So I'm really happy that I've set this up correctly. So I've convinced myself that all of the units cancel out and now I'm going to go ahead and turn this into pounds. And so my friend weighs 95 pounds. Here's another one where we're dealing with um, volume. This time our beginning volume is given in milliliters and I'd like to turn it into cubic feet. So cubic feet is obviously a um, volume within the English system of units. So step one, write what I'm given on the left and then uh, write the units for what I would like to end up with on the right of my page. 
So how I might do this it really depends on the information that I am given in my tables. Whenever I'm converting between metric and English units, I'm going to have to look for a table of conversion factors. And in the table of conversion factors that I had, they only had information relating centimeters and inches. So a sensible pathway to go would be from milliliters to centimeters cubed. And as I have information relating centimeters cubed, I can then go on to inches and then finally on to the desired feet cubed. So this is going to be a little bit more um, complicated because I'm going to do one, two, three conversions. Each will require a conversion factor. So 375 milliliters. To convert milliliters into centimeters cubed, I just have to recall that one centimeter cubed is exactly the same as one milliliter. So I've made the first conversion quite easily. Now to convert from centimeters cubed onto inches, I need to find um, uh, onto inches cubed. I need to find information relating these two in a table in my book because this is metric and this is English. And the information that I found is that one inch is equal to 2.54 centimeters. I have to remember to cube my conversion factor in order for this to work correctly. And now centimeters cubed cancels out, leaving me with inches cubed. So to convert from inches cubed to feet cubed, what I keep in mind is that there are 12 inches in one foot. So inches is up here, so inches goes down there. One foot equals 12 inches. And there we go, my inches cancel out. I've got to remember to cube my conversion factor. So everything looks good, all of my units cancel out, and then when I do the math, this is the answer that I get. When you do the math, if you want to, obviously if you, re you can recognize that one on one is equal to one, so multiplying by one doesn't really change your number, so if you wanted to, you could kind of actually skip entering that guy into your calculator. So perhaps it would be worth um, me showing you how I would enter this into my calculator. So I'll just pop up my um, my calculator and you can see this. Turn my calculator on. So this is the math that I'm going to do here. 375 times. I really don't need to do the one on one. I'll put some parentheses in there. 1 divide 2.540 close parentheses cubed and to move on over times open up a new parentheses 1 on 12 don't forget to close my parentheses parentheses raised to the power of 3 and then just press enter and there you go this is in decimal notation here I chose to write it in scientific notation if I want to, I can just go mode, can move on over to scientific notation, set that, then quit, and then when I ask it to display the answer now, it'll give it to me in scientific notation, and that aligns with what I've got on the slide there. Okay. More complicated um, units will have more than one measurement in them. So, for example, a speed is often given as distance per unit time. And how we write these units is with a fraction representing the unit label. Grams per, lil uh, per litre, we're going to write that as 3 grams per litre. So, again, the unit label has a fraction in it. So when we have these complex units, what I'm calling complex units, we can see here that we could convert the miles here into different units of length, and we could also convert the time here into different units of time. Or in this case, where we've got grams per litre, we could convert the grams into different units of mass and the litres into different units of volume. Or sometimes we could convert 
both of them. So we might convert grams to milligrams and we might convert liters to meters cubed. So theoretically, we could have you know two um, tool conversions occurring for this one unit label. For example, if I want to convert miles per hour to meters per second, I would have to convert first the miles into meters, and then I'd have to convert the hours into seconds. So there would be two unit conversions in the one problem. So this is a good example. It says global emissions of carbon dioxide are estimated at 2 by 10 to the 9 tons per year. Convert this rate to pounds per hour. So when we have one of these unit labels that says something per something else, it's always best to write it as a fraction and the bottom of your fraction will always have a 1 in it. So this 2, point, a two by 10 to the 9 tons per year is best written as 2 times 10 to the 9 tons for every one year. So that's our, what we want to convert written on the left and then on the right we write the unit label for what we want to end up with which is going to be pounds per hour. So we're writing that as a fraction. So hopefully you can see here I've got to turn my tons into pounds and I've got to turn my years into hours. So you know there's two conversions to do there. So um, it turns out I looked up some information about tons and pounds and there are 2,000 pounds in one ton. So to convert my tons to pounds I've got to multiply by the conversion factor that has tons on the bottom line and pounds on the top line. So I got this guy done in one step. So now I want to convert my years to hours and I don't really know how to do this in one step but what I do know is that in one year there are 365.25 days. So I can turn my years into days. Now this is a little bit different. I'm going to need the years on the top line of my conversion factor in order to cancel out the years that were in my original units. So now I've succeeded in converting my number into pounds per days. But I don't want that. What I want is I want it in pounds per hour. So I've got to turn days into hours. So I've got to multiply by a conversion factor that has days on the top line and hours on the bottom line. And I recall from memory that there is 24 hours in one day. So one day for every 24 hours. And then boom, boom, leaving me with hours. So the only units that remain now after affecting these three conversions are pounds and hours. So I know I got this guy right and I can go ahead and put this into my calculator. My original measurement here had one significant figure. There it is there, just one significant figure. So my answer has one significant figure. All of the values that are in this, these conversion factors are exact. They're based on unit definitions, so they don't influence our number of significant figures. These guys all have infinity significant figures. The thing that is important here is that our original measurement had one significant figure. Okay. So we did a bunch of really kind of like quite complicated dimensional analysis problems and unit conversion um, problems. So the, the key idea is that a conversion factor is a fraction that has units that you want to get rid of on the bottom line and the units that you would like in your answer on the top line. If we use dimensional analysis, we leave in our units while we're performing our math. And in fact, we don't actually begin entering numbers into our calculator until we have convinced ourselves that our units um, cancel out correctly, leaving us only with the desired units. Okay. A particular, a particularly important uh, measurement in uh, chemistry is density. And density is the ratio of an object's mass to its volume. So um, 
some properties of um, density is that an object will sink in a fluid that it is more dense than. So if you throw a rock into a lake, it will sink. And that tells you that rocks are more dense than liquid water. An object will float in a liquid that it is less dense than. So if you put a cork into a bathtub, the cork will float. And that tells you that cork is less dense than liquid water. This is a little bit of an odd one. Um, a um, object will remain stationary. That means that it will neither float nor sink. It will stay exactly where you leave it in a column of water if it has the same density as that, or in a column of liquid, if it has the same density as that liquid. So I can um, put an object at a certain height in a container full of liquid and it's submerged and it won't it'll neither sink nor float it'll just stay wherever you put it so uh, an example of a super dense liquid is mercury which um, someone has put into this um, um, pint glass and you can see that liquid mercury is actually more dense than the uh, polymer or the plastic that this uh, number three um, um, ball is made of so that's kind of like, you know, that's an example. I forget the density of mercury, but it's nearly 10, 10 times as dense as um, water. Perhaps I'll look that up and let you know in class what that is. So the amazing thing about this photo is that somebody brought a pint of mercury to a bar, then poured that mercury into a glass and put a, the number three ball in it off the pool table. So um, anyway, it's a weird way of demonstrating this idea, but that's what I saw when I looked this up on the internet. So density is useful because it can act as a conversion factor between volume and mass. So a density will have um, units of mass over volume. And this can always be reorganized to give two conversion factors. So one where, uh, when we write this out sort of in the conventional way, we would read this as 1.03 grams of the substance for every one milliliter, but it would be equally valid to write that for every one milliliter there are 1.03 grams. Either way of writing this is fine. So this guy will function as a conversion factor that takes milliliters and turns it into grams, and this guy will take uh, will function as a conversion factor that takes grams and turns them into milliliters. So the first one can take volume and turn it into mass. And then the second one, when you multiply a mass by that guy, it gives you back a volume. So you can see that density is the conversion and factor that relates volume and mass. So here's a little example. Blood, pl blood plasma, blood, bleh, try that again. Blood plasma, which is basically like kind of salty water. It's the, the liquid part of your blood. It has a density of 1.027 grams per milliliter at 25 degrees Celsius. So then it asks, what, in, what volume in milliliters does 125 grams of plasma occupy? So what we're really trying to do here is we're trying to convert grams into milliliters. So from our density, we can construct two conversion factors. We can take this, we can have, have this one, which states that we have 1.027 grams of blood plasma for every one milliliter. Or we can construct this guy that says for every one milliliter, we have 1.027 grams. I want to get rid of grams and end up with milliliters. So I'm going to be using this conversion factor here. So grams, grams goes, leaving me with milliliters. And I don't know why, but this should have the label milliliters, just like that. Okay. So here's one where we're dealing with a gas. It says air has a density of 1.29 grams per liter at room temperature. What is the mass of four and a half liters of air at room temperature? So using my um, density, I can construct two conversion factors, 1.29 grams for every one liter. That guy will take liters and turn it into grams. Or I could write 
for every one liter, I get 1.29 grams. So this is the one that I'm going to want to use because I want to get rid of liters and be left with grams. So here we go, 4.5 liters. Liters cancels out, leaving me with grams. So 4.5 times 1.29 is what I would put in my calculator. This number here has three significant figures. This number here has three significant figures. My answer has three significant figures. So that's kind of really it, you know. Um, a density is used to convert between mass and volume. It's an example of what we call an equivalency type conversion factor. That's a ratio that converts from two different types of measurements. So in this case, we're converting from mass and volume. Now, there are other um, equivalency conversion factors, and we'll be um, looking at those in the next section as well. So some other equivalency conversion factors other than density, these are going to be things that have different units on the top and the bottom. So we already looked at the idea of speed, perhaps being meters per second. And something that you're probably familiar with if you've um, ever bought gas would be that gas is priced at dollars per gallon. So these things are not kind of like, you know, altogether unfamiliar to us. So common equivalency conversion factors are rates of change. And in chemistry, we're not going to be dealing with rates of change in like location, i.e. a speed. We're going to be more interested in rates of like how much of a substance are we making per unit time. Sometimes we're interested in concentration, that is how much of a substance that we have in a given volume of solution. And less often um, in the chemistry lab than in real life, we might be interested in what we call cost relationships. That is, how much of a substance do I get per unit of cost, which is often dollars. So, um, you know, these can be a little bit tricky, but they're really just an extension of all of the ideas that we've been using before. So it says the vitamin A concentration of my uncle's blood was measured to be 125 micrograms for every one milliliter. So this is an example of a concentration. This is micrograms of vitamin A for every 100 milliliters of the solution or of the blood in this case. It says how many grams of vitamin A is in three and a half liters of blood? So we've got three and a half liters of blood and we want to turn it into, not micrograms, into grams. So what I want to do is I'm going to take my liters and I want to turn it into milliliters. Now the reason for doing that is because this is what I'm going to use to get my conversion factor for converting between mass and volume. So what that's telling me is that my volume must be in milliliters. When I apply this conversion factor, I'm going to get a mass in micrograms. So I'm going to go from liters to milliliters. Then I'm going to apply this conversion factor, and that will give me a mass in micrograms, which I will then use decimal prefixes to move on to grams. So I've got one, two, three conversions to achieve. The first one is not too bad. 3.5 liters times 1 milliliter for every 10 to the minus 3 liters. I'm getting this power of 10 by just simply substituting for the meaning of the prefix milli. So my liters cancel out and I've achieved my first conversion. In order to turn a volume into a mass, I need to use a density. And so here's my density up here, 125 micrograms for every 100 milliliters. So this has got milliliters on the bottom already. So I'm just going to apply that as it's written. And then that's going to give me my micrograms. And so I've achieved my second unit conversion. Now I need to turn my micrograms 
into grams and how I'm going to get the conversion factor for this guy is by recalling the definition of the prefix micro. So one microgram is equivalent to 10 to the minus 6 grams. So I multiply by the conversion factor that has micrograms on the bottom line and grams on the top line and that gets rid of my micrograms leaving my grams. So I'm feeling pretty happy about this. This is going to give me what I want. So I've cancelled out all of my units and I'm ready to go and put all of this into my calculator. Turns out you don't have a lot of vitamin A in your blood. In three and a half litres of blood, you only have 4.4 by 10 to the minus 3 grams of vitamin A. Or that is 4.4 milligrams of vitamin A and three and a half liters of blood is you know close on you know all of the blood in an adult. Here's one where we've got a rate of change and we're talking about how much of a substance that a chemist can make in a given amount of time. So um, what we've got here is this chemist can make 500 milligrams of substance for every one second and the question becomes how many grams can they make in a standard eight hour shift? So what we're going to do here is we're going to take eight hours, that's the unit of time, and we're going to turn that into grams. Now, our, con our key conversion factor here has mass in milligrams, and it has time in seconds. So what I'm going to need to do is to take my 8 hours and before I can apply this guy, I'm going to have to turn it into seconds. So my kind of pathway is going to be hours to minutes and then minutes on to seconds. At which point I can use the information in my, um, in my number up here to get myself and um, turn my time into milligrams. Once I've got into milligrams, I'm in mass units at that point, but I need to do one further conversion factor, one co further conversion to get it into grams. So this is the most complicated problem that we've done so far because I've got one, two, three, four conversion factors. So let's bring it on. Eight hours. Multiply by the conversion factor that has hours on the bottom line. I want to turn into minutes, so I need minutes on my top line. There are 60 minutes in one hour. Hours cancels out. I've done my first conversion. Now I need to turn minutes into seconds, so I've got to multiply by the conversion factor that has minutes on the bottom line and seconds on the top. And there are 60 seconds in one minute, so minutes will cancel out. So I'm all the way over to seconds now. Here I am here. All right. At this point, I can apply um, my rate of change up here. So milligrams per second. So I know I get 500 milligrams per second. So if I multiply by this number, that will get rid of seconds. And now, I, for the first time, I've got units of mass. So I'm all the way over to milligrams, and what I need to do now is use this decimal prefix in the milligrams to get a power of 10, and then I can use that to convert into grams. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to multiply by the conversion factor that has milligrams on the bottom line, grams on the top line, and in that way, milligrams will cancel out, leaving me with grams. So that's pretty impressive. I've got one. Two, one, two, three, four conversion factors. That's about as complicated as we ever get in chemistry 139. So I think I got it all set up. I check that my units cancel out. If they didn't, I would go back and fix it. At that point, I wouldn't bother entering anything into my calculator. I only have grams left over, which is exactly what I want. So I put all those numbers into my calculator and away I go. And there you are. And it turns out you, he can make quite a bit. He can make 1.4 by 10 to the 4 grams in an 8-hour shift. That's 14 kilograms of stuff. Here's one where it's a cost um, relationship. 
and in this case we're talking about the price of aluminum it's selling for 91.25 cents per pound and I want to convert this to um, I want to find out the cost in dollars of 2525 pounds of aluminum so I'm trying to turn 2525 pounds into dollars so what I know is that the number that I'm given is cents per pound so it's able to turn pounds into cents so my logical kind of pathway would be to use this number to turn my pounds into cents and then once I get to cents I can use the appropriate conversion factor to turn that into dollars so this is going to be a two-step process and I'm using my information that was given right from the beginning. So 2,525 pounds, multiply that by the conversion factor that has pounds on the bottom line and cents on the top. And I'm getting these numbers from the information that was given. It's 91.25 cents for every one pound. So at this point, I've taken my pounds and I've turned it into cents. What I need to do now is my second conversion and turn this into dollars. So I have to multiply by the conversion factor that has cents on the bottom line and dollars on the top. So I'm going to multiply this by one dollar for every 100 cents. Cents disappears, leaving me with dollars. So I feel really happy that I got all of this um, set up okay. 2,525 pounds is going to cost me. Nah, it's going to cost a little less than $2,500, right? We know that because it's just shy of a dollar a pound. Before I do any math, though, I'm going to check that all of my units cancel out, leaving behind only dollars. They do. Put that guy into my calculator, and I'm really happy to see that I end up with a number that is a little less than $2,525, and that's consistent with the cost of aluminum being 91 and a quarter cents per pound. Whew. Well, we did all of the really tough um, conversion factors using equivalency conversion factors. We looked at using um, density, we looked at using concentration, we looked at rates of change, that's an amount per time, and we looked at cost relationships where we looked at the amount of something and how that's related to the cost. So this really kind of covers absolutely everything that we you know every kind of conversion factor that we're ever likely to encounter there is a um, special kind of um, conversion factor that you've probably seen a few times but not really thought of it as being um, useful as a conversion factor and that's a percentage so what a percentage is another way of um, describing a percentage is part Trying to write here, getting cramp in my hand, writing with the mouse. Per 100. And that seems a little odd until you see kind of the next slide. So, a percentage can be defined as the number of items of a given type in a total of 100 items. And generally, how we calculate it is we take the number of items that we're interested in divided by the total number of items and then we multiply that by a hundred and what is that equal to that's equal to the number of items of a given type in a total of 100 and it's often this bit up here that we forget and it's this definition that we're going to be using to create conversion and um, factors so calculating a percent is one skill. You want to be able to use this little formula. You have probably done this in the past. I do it all the time when I calculate your percentage on a test. To calculate the percent that you got correct, I take the number of correct answers, divide that by the total of oh, the number of correct points, divide that by the total number of points possible, and I multiply it by 100. You should be able to do that and calculate the percentage of a different type of um, item. Okay. Percentage can be used as a conversion factor if you recall that initial de um, a definition of it being the number of parts per of interest for every 100 parts total. So this is kind of related to a lab that my students in general chemistry are doing at the moment. 
and where they're attempting to find the percent zinc that is in an alloy. So this says here, the um, an alloy was found to be 66% zinc by mass. So what does that mean? What that means is that for uh, you get 66 grams of zinc for every 100 grams of the alloy total, and that's a fraction, so that can be used as a conversion factor. Another way of stating this information is that for every 100 grams of alloy, you get 66 grams of zinc. So from a percentage, you can always get two conversion factors. This guy will turn grams of alloy into grams of zinc, and this one over here will turn grams of zinc into grams of alloy. So here's a little example. A sample of air is found to be 20.9% oxygen by volume. So that's a little fact that's worth remembering. Air is around about 21% oxygen, and then it's around about 79% and nitrogen depends on you know the kind of exact location but around those amounts so how many milliliters of oxygen are present in 375 mils of air so i want to take 375 mils of air and turn that into milliliters of oxygen and this is going to be the key piece of information that will allow me to do that because what this number is really saying here is that you get 20.9 milliliters of oxygen for every 100 milliliters of air. So here I go, using my percentage, I cancel out my milliliters of air, leaving me with milliliters of oxygen. So I can be really confident that I got this all set up okay. I've canceled my units out. I only have the thing that I'm interested in left. And so I go ahead and put my uh, numbers into my calculator. And I know that in 375 milliliters of air, only a small fraction of that, about one-fifth, will be oxygen. So the fact that my number here is smaller than 375 makes me very happy. All of my numbers that I'm using here have three significant figures. So I've made certain that my answer is rounded off to three significant figures. It's a modestly complex um, problem. Another way that we'll use um, percentages in chemistry is to calculate what we call the percent error. So the percent error of a measurement is calculated using, a for, um, using the following formula. It may be either a negative number or it could be a positive number depending whether our measured value is greater or less than the true or accepted value. So your percent error is equal to your measured value minus the true or the accepted value. You need to make sure that this is put into parentheses or your calculation will not do what you're hoping it will do. And then we're going to divide that by our accepted value and times it by 100. If our measured value is greater than our accepted value, we will get a positive percent error. And if our measured value is less than our accepted value, we'll get a negative percent error. So really, this is kind of just, you know, a plug and chug type of thing. It's the kind of um, activity that we might do in the lab. You might be asked, calculate the percent error of something that you have determined. So it says the length of a piece of string is known to be 30.2 centimeters. So that is the accepted value. And then it says a student measured the string to have a length of 29 centimeters. That's my measured value. My measured value is less than my accepted value, so I'm expecting a negative percent error. And then we go on, what is the percent error? So it is ex a measured value minus accepted value, all in parentheses, divided by the accepted value, and then don't forget to times by 100. And so this particular student was under by 4%. So negative 4% was the error there. All right, so that brings us to the end of that little section on um, using percentage as a conversion factor and also of calculating the percentage error of a measured value in comparison to the accepted value. 
So something that we are yet to deal with is how do we do conversions between different temperature scales. So temperature scales are weird because they have different zero points. So when I think about mass scales, zero pounds is exactly the same as zero kilograms, which is exactly the same as zero ounces. So all of the mass scales have the same zero point. Similarly with length, zero kilometers is exactly the same length as zero millimeters or even zero miles. However, zero degrees Celsius does not equal zero degrees Fahrenheit, it equals 32 degrees Fahrenheit. There's, so that kind of creates um, a slight difference, a slight difficulty we have to correct for the difference in the zero points. So, in science, we have three common temperature scales that we use. We have the Celsius scale, the Kelvin scale, and the Fahrenheit scale. And to convert between these three different temperature scales, we have to use formulas. And so we can't just use a conversion factor because these guys have different zero points. So um, you'll see that there's a 32 in both of the formulas relating Celsius and Fahrenheit reflecting how the zero point in these scales is offset by 32 degrees. In the formula relating Celsius and Kelvin, you can see that we have this number here, 273.15, indicating that those scales have a zero point that is offset by 273.15 units. So let's pop this up in terms of what um, thermometers of these three um, systems look like when they're placed side by side. And so here we have a Fahrenheit phenomena, a thermometer next to a Celsius thermometer. And we can see that we've marked on here the freezing point of water on both. In Celsius, water freezes at 0 degrees Celsius. And in Fahrenheit, it's 32 degrees Celsius. We've also marked on here the boiling point of water which in Celsius is 100 degrees Celsius, and in Fahrenheit, it is 212 degrees Fahrenheit. So there are 100 Celsius units between the freezing point and the boiling point of water. However, there are 180 Fahrenheit units between the freezing point and the boiling point of water. So we do a little bit of math here. There's 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit for every 1 degree Celsius, or 1.8 is the same as 9 on 5. So we get 9 on 5 Celsius units for every 1, um, that. We get 9 on 5 Fahrenheit units for every 1 Celsius unit. So there's a difference there. Okay, the other problem that we have to correct for is the fact that these guys, apart from the size of a Fahrenheit unit, is different from a Celsius unit. We have to also correct for the fact that the zeros are not in the same spot. They're offset by 32 degrees. So that's where these formulas come from. This number here reflects the fact that uh, there are 180 Fahrenheit units for every 100 Celsius units. So this is when we simplify 180. Um, when we simplify 180 on 100, that's the best fraction that we can get. And then the 32 here explains away or um, accounts for the fact that we have the zero points are offset by 32 degrees. So when it comes time to kind of convert between um, these two systems of units, I always am. Um, and get people to consider a couple of things. First of all, if you turn 32 degrees Fahrenheit into Celsius, your formula, if you record it correctly, should return 0 degrees Celsius. And similarly, if you take 212 degrees Fahrenheit and turn it into Celsius, your formula should return 100 degrees Celsius. So 37 degrees Celsius is approximately body temperature. And when I put this into the formula, sure enough, it returns 99 degrees Fahrenheit. 
Now, interestingly, this is a hyper or an imaginary um, Kelvin thermometer laid next to an imaginary Celsius thermometer. And what you can see is the markings on both scales are the space between them is exactly the same. So what I'm trying to indicate here is that the size of the Kelvin unit is the same as a as a, Kel a Celsius degree. However, when we look at the zero point, you can see that they're very 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 different. Zero Kelvin is equal to minus 273.15 degrees Celsius. So when we are converting between Kelvin and degrees Celsius, we don't have to multiply by anything to account for a difference in the size of the units, but we do have to add this term 273.15. This can kind of make things, when we're calculating the change in a temperature, this can make things a little easy because the units are the same size. Whatever the change in temperature is in degrees Celsius, you'll get exactly the same change in temperature when we use Kelvin units. Okay, so converting between Celsius and Kelvin, pretty simple. You've just got to decide whether to add or subtract to 73.15. So that's really the only thing that you need to keep in mind. So just remember one form of the expression and then you can always reorganize it to get what you want and from there on in it's just kind of plug and chug okay so temperature is a little different there's three common temperature scales kelvin fahrenheit and celsius these guys are related by formulas not just conversion factors so that's an important idea um, we have to use convert we have to use formulas and not just conversion factors because the zeros are not in the same spot. A Kelvin unit has the same size as a Celsius unit, but the zeros are offset by 273.15. Fahrenheit and Celsius units are different sizes, so that's a complication. And in addition, the scales are also and offset by 32 degrees, so 32 degrees Fahrenheit is 0 degrees Celsius, and that's another complication that we have to take into account um, through the use of our formula. So this video is um, pushing an hour, um, but um, luckily that brings us to the end of um, chapter 3.